Hi, I'm Sebastian Dieterding, and I'm happy to present to you today our paper, How Does Juicy Game Feedback Motivate? Now, juice or juiciness or juicy feedback matters. It's a recognized interaction aesthetic that makes interfaces more engaging and enjoyable, particularly in games, casual games like Candy Crush, where in every individual swipe, right, you get rich feedback, rich interactions, rich animation and sound packs, but we also see it increasingly labeled gamification or not in productivity uh, applications where we see similarly rich non-essential interaction feedback like here in this case in a uh, contact managing app. But surprisingly, even though we recognize that it's important, it's enjoyable, it's engaging, we actually don't understand it very well. And that is for two main reasons. The first reason is that the term juiciness or juicy fatback itself is pretty underspecified and ambiguous. Originally, it was introduced by game development students Kyle Gray and others, who said juice was our wet little term for constant and bountiful user feedback. They described it for their uh, indie game world of Gru, where moving around these little goo balls would produce right rich animation and juicy, squishy feedback sound, actually. Um, but in its usage, since people have used it to describe lots of different other kinds of experience, sometimes they use it to describe feedback features like excessive positive feedback. Other times people use it to describe particular player experiences like this feels alive. Sometimes people use it to describe very specific player experiences like it makes me feel powerful. Sometimes it is used to describe the amplification of any kind of desired player experience, not just necessarily an experience of power. And overall, people have noted that it is hard to define as an experiential quality from the get-go. Now, secondly, if we then look into the empirical research, we find that the literature is very much in an effect searching mode. Um, that is in part because we don't have a really strong consensus definition or operationalization. So different papers use different things and then say the thing that we did, that is what we claim is juicy. Similarly, we find a very high measurement variance. People use a wide range of different scales or even unvalidated single items. Um, and we find open effect searching where the majority of studies that we found ran four batteries of seven up to 20 player constructs without clear prior hypothesis about what juicy feedback should or shouldn't impact. And taken together with false positive risk where we see lots of small samples and no pre-registrations, uh, all of that still adds up to quite contradictory results where in tendency juicy feedback seems to be appealing and preferred and enjoyable, but we get very mixed findings. And you could say the summary is various things that people call juicy can affect various player experiences and sometimes they cannot. So as a result, we have really good heuristics or frameworks about juicy game feel or game feedback that synthesize a lot of that emphasis uh, of those insights, but these frameworks uh, diverge and contradict each other and they can tell very many untested claims. So as a result, when it comes to juicy feedback, we still don't know what works and how. That is, what specific isolatable design features produce what kinds of positive player experiences and how through what kind of specific psychological mechanism. To address this gap, we tested three specific theories that specify concrete features and mechanisms. The first theory that we tested is effectance theory that was originally introduced by Robert White, the forefather of intrinsic motivation in psychology. But effectance theory has particularly been appealed to by Christian Klimt, a media psychologist, to explain one of the appeals of games. Klimt says that at the, at the immediate level of moment-to-moment -moment input output loops, already seeing immediate amplified consequences of actions already gives us a positive experience of agency or effectance. So purely amplified action feedback should increase enjoyment or engagement, uh, as we put it in the hypothesis. And in terms of our structural equation models that we tested, amplified feedback should load onto effectance, that should load onto enjoyment, and that should load onto free choice playtime. Now compare that to self-determination theory, which makes a slightly different claim when it comes to this kind of juicy feedback. Here, Scott Rigby and Richard Ryan in Glue to Games propose that it's not just amplified action feedback, but that it is 
feedback on succeeding at challenging tasks, so success-dependent feedback that satisfies our needs for competence, and that competence need satisfaction is what drives enjoyment, and it is what drives then free choice playtime. And they give Gita Hero as an example for this kind of granular success and competence feedback. Thirdly, as I proposed in my own work on gamification, um, it may be that in games like Candy Crush, it's not just competence or effectiveness, but it's also curiosity that makes juicy feedback motivating. And that is because feedback is so varied and so uncertain, so surprising what happens, that this kind of uncertainty in a variety, so amplified varied feedback, is what drives enjoyment and engagement mediated by curiosity. And to test these three competing theoretical claims, we built a custom single-player action RPG in order to manipulate different feedback conditions. We did 20 minutes of write testing and expert review uh, in order to make sure that our different conditions were actually playable, they were equally hard, and they actually manifested our three different theories. Uh, we created two times two plus a control condition to vary amplification, success dependence, and variation. Um, so in the standard condition, the control condition, you players just got minimal necessary feedback on all actions. And I'll show you that condition here. So, right? um, on swinging swords or hitting the enemy, you just see kind of the, the, the enemy health bar going down. In the amplified non-success dependent, non-varied condition, people would see single effects already on sword swings that would be amplified, but also on hitting an enemy on killing it, while in the varied condition, these kind of amplified feedback would be varied. In the success dependent condition, you would get amplified feedback, but not just on swinging the sword, just on hitting the enemy and killing the enemy, while you would get a standard kind of feedback on just swinging a sword. And again, that was in a varied or a non-varied condition. And here you see the varied condition where on swinging swords, hitting an enemy, hitting the enemy. So things that would require a modicum of challenge, a modicum of skill, and get lots of very different feedback. How did we design the study? We pre-registered it on OSF. We had a valid sample of 1,700 paid participants. We recruited them through Prolific, which in a simulation study made us very confident that we would be able to detect even small uh, standardized effects. It was a between-subject online experiment where people were randomly assigned to one of our five conditions. Participants would download a game, and if they passed a benchmark test that their machine was strong enough, then they were asked to play 10 minutes, then to self-report, and after fulfilling the self-report, they were offered to exit the study whenever they wanted, and on average, players played about 40 minutes. We measured enjoyment with the IMI enjoyment interest subscale, competence and curiosity with the PXI mastery and curiosity scales, and effectiveness with the recommended modified effectiveness and game scales, Details on that in the paper. Finally, voluntary engagement. We measured with how many pe minutes people voluntarily played after we told them you can exit the experiment at any point in time. So what were our results? First off, we found a lot of things sh shaked up as expected in self-determination theory. We found that success dependence actually positively correlated with competence, competence with enjoyment. So that was as predicted. Surprisingly, however, neither enjoyment directly or competence directly would have an impact on free choice playtime. Hold that thought, we'll get to that later. Second, what about effectiveness? Again, as predicted, we found that effectiveness drives enjoyment, but surprisingly not playtime. Even more surprisingly, amplified feedback versus our standard control condition had a negative significant correlation with effectiveness and even more strongly so with competence. So amplified feedback made things worse. How on earth is that possible? Well, when we looked into our game conditions again, we found that this might have been because the feedback just on sourcing was so long and so loud visually that it might have partially occluded the different feedback that people might have gotten on hitting the enemy and killing the enemy. So as a result, people might have felt less sense of agency, less control, less impact on hitting and actually killing enemy. And then when we looked back into different kind of juiciness heuristics by Kieran Hicks and others, we found that this finding matched a lot of their heuristics around coherent feedback or unambiguous or relevant feedback. So this is basically some kind of suggestive empirical evidence 
why these heuristics matter. They matter because if you don't follow them, you might impede a player's sense of agency. And this might also be a possible precondition for effectiveness and for competence and why we therefore saw lower competence and lower effectiveness. Thirdly, in terms of curiosity, again, surprisingly to us, we found that variability did not impact curiosity, but success dependence did. Now, why could that be? Well, here, if you look into previous works around what stokes curiosity in games, it is uncertainty. And in qualitative work by Kumari and colleagues, they suggested that one of those uncertainties is outcome uncertainty. What is the outcome of my action? What is the result? And it may be, if you then look into other literature around curiosity, that curiosity is stoked by reducible outcome uncertainty, by the ability to, over time as a player, get better and better at reducing uncertainty, predicting the outcome that you expect, even though there is still some uncertainty. And if you have purely random variety in the outcomes that you observe the animation, that impedes this kind of learning process of slowly reducing uncertainty and getting better at predicting what happens next. Our final surprising result, particularly when it comes to curiosity, is that curiosity drives enjoyment very strongly, and it was the only and a very strong in playtime predictor. For every point increase in curiosity on a Likert scale, uh, we saw a 0.8 minute increase in playtime, right, which is about 10% of the total uh, average free choice playtime that we observed. So why might that be? Now, we don't have enough time here to go really into detail, um, so read the paper for more detail, but we think this aligns well with long-standing neurological models around different systems for wanting versus liking and more recent reinforcement learning models of intrinsic motivation that basically say what motivates us to approach things and do them is a sense of wanting, a learned expectation that good things come of this, while positive experiences of liking, which is what most player experience construct and enjoyment argue to measure, is a sensation of liking that is not in and of itself motivating, but it is basically the training or learning signal that builds up expectational wanting. And curiosity in these models tracks wanting, it doesn't track liking. So what are the limitations of our studies? First off, as we noted, our manipulation may have blocked a sense of agency, so we should retest it with a revised manipulation. Our operationalization are valid in terms of our theories, we think, but they don't mirror all notions of juiciness. So people interested in different ideas of juiciness should test and theorize these different understandings. Third, we use a single action RPG, short playtime, so we should definitely test with other genres and for longer durations. Finally, while between subject designs like the one that we used are arguably more ecologically valid, they're less sensitive to subtle effects. So if we really want to test for the absence of subtle effects, we might want to use the within subject design. And the effect and scale that we used has some known issues. Read more about that in the paper. So retesting with a different scale might be advised. So in summary, what have we taken away? Juiciness or amplified feedback drives curiosity and competence and curiosity, not enjoyment, drive play, drives play. First things, success-dependent amplified feedback drives these positive experiences, potentially by affording resolvable uncertainty for curiosity and making competence experience more salient. Sense of agency may be an important factor or precondition for competence and effectance, uh, which is why we saw that in our case, uh, amplification, which blocked sense of agency, actually worsen these, and it may explain a Goldilocks effect in feedback volume that previous literature has observed. Too much feedback occludes sense of agency. This can, we also think, this negative correlation that we found explain juiciness heuristics like unambiguity, coherence, highlighting, or relevance by colleagues like Kieran Hicks and others. We found that not all forms of randomness or variety afford curiosity and enjoyments. It needs to be reducible uncertainty from randomness. And finally, curiosity is a strong, underappreciated motivator in gameplay, even in moment-to-moment -moment interaction. And with that, I thank you.